Normally, I would have to rile you up a little bit for a 10 a.m. talk on Sunday, but since you already all had a, an 8 a.m. talk on epistemology, um, I don't have to do that. Um, so it's a delight to be here today and uh, talking about life, liberty, and intellectual property. Now, intellectual property, um, it's a bit of a paradox today. Now, by intellectual property, I mean a category of property rights. Uh, typically, it's patents, which cover new types of technological inventions, copyrights, which cover creative works, art, music, trademarks, which cover logos and corporate designs, and trade secrets, which cover uh, valuable commercial secrets that companies use to produce their products. Um, <clears throat> This is all within the category of intellectual property. This is a type of property. It's protected as a property right, along with property rights in land, air, water, your personal goods like your bicycles, your wallets, your computers. Uh, it's property rights like credit um, that you have with your credit cards, corporations and the corporate terms of copyrights, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, I said it's a bit of a, par a paradox today, and I'm going to refer to it as IP because it's a bit of a mouthful constantly to say intellectual property. IP is a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, right, it functions like all these other property rights do. It secures the fruits of the productive labors of the people who create new values in the world. And specifically, it secures to them their profits from those productive labors and creating something new. And as a property right, it's the basis for venture capital investments and startups, billions in R&D that flow into biotech innovation and high-tech innovation. And it, thus, it makes possible the contracts in complex supply chains and distribution chains in the, in the free market. I mean, you already, don't know, you already know that as a fact. Right? Because anyone who watches Shark Tank knows that the very first question asked of every person who appears before them is, do you have a patent in this? And the reason is because you need a property right to secure that idea, that new invention. And in fact, because of this, the United States IP system is widely recognized by historians and economists as being essential to a thriving free market and a growing innovation economy. Great innovators and artists have all made, were all made possible by intellectual property. Right? So, up on the, uh, on the screen, um, as, uh, my, uh, oh, no screen, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, you have, uh, Tom, of course, Thomas Edison on your, on, on, your, on your left and Alexander Graham Bell on your right. But of course, many others uh, who we all learn in school, the Wright brothers, Walt Disney, Mark Twain. Um, these were all people made possible by the intellectual property protection secured to them in their creative works and innovations. Um, and it also underlied essential revolutions later in the 20th century. So they were essential to the digital revolution, the transistor that was invented at Bell Labs in the 1940s, that's the basis of all digital technology. Later, the invention of the integrated circuit by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments and Bob Noyce at uh, integrated uh, circuits, um, which later becomes Intel, um, and is the foundation of our personal computers today. It's been necessary for the biotech revolution. I mean, the types of medications and treatments that we obtain today are miracles compared to what people obtained even 50 or 60 years ago. We actually can treat viruses now, right? Viruses, the scourge of humanity for thousands of years, right? We survive hundreds and hundreds of cancer diagnoses that even 10 years ago were death sentences for the people who received them. This is all because of biotech driven by the patents that secure the R&D in these valuable new innovations. So it's ubiquitous in our lives today. But on the other hand, IP is critiqued and attacked constantly, especially by leftists and by libertarians. They accuse it of being a monopoly grant. They attack it as an unjust restriction on our liberty rights and on our property rights. They claim that it locks up ideas and therefore prevents innovation from actually occurring. And this is a constant argument that one hears. In fact, if you Google patent system broken, I think you get about 700,000 hits um, on, what, on, on how the patent system is broken, that it undermines innovation today. So in sum, there's a lot of confusion about IP rights. And this is understandable because it's rooted in a lot of similar confusions about the nature and function of property rights more generally. Right? So the structure of my talk today is going to be twofold. First, I'm going to explain why intellectual property is not a strange case. It is, in fact, property. It's a classic case of property, of what the government should do in securing to people the fruits of their productive labors, and thereby promoting a free market, 
and thereby driving an innovation economy that ultimately leads to flourishing lives and a flourishing society. And then second, to support this abstract philosophical discussion, I'm going to identify kind of the history and economics that confirms this moral truth about intellectual property and how the American founders themselves recognized this important essential insight that intellectual property should be, ought to be secured to the people who create these valuable new inventions and creative works that make our lives better. And this is in fact why the United States has had a successful free market and an innovation economy for most of its history. Now I'm going to just give an outline of these points because I want to leave lots of time for Q&A because people have tons of questions about, about uh, intellectual property. I love the questions, you know, I know a guy who got a patent on an alien and is this. <laughs> so, I want, so I want to leave lots of time for questions. So it's just going to be a sketch, an outline of, some, of the basic points and then we can get into the details in the Q&A. All right, so first, was first part of the, the talk. The key to understanding why intellectual property is property is to recognize that all property, all property, is essentially at root intellectual in nature. Now, I discussed this already at length in a prior talk I did for Ocon about six years ago called Intellectual Property Rights, Securing the Values of the Mind. Um, and that's where you, that's the, from, the, from the Ayn Rand store uh, uh, website. I love looking at that if only because um, on the internet, no one knows that you age. It's like the reverse, reverse Dorian Gray. Um, it's awesome. Thank you, Anu, for keeping a picture there from about 15 years ago. <laughs> before the children, before 30 articles. <laughs> so, um, so, so what I'm going to go through is just an outline of, the, of what I cover really in depth in that talk. All right. So again, the essential truth is to recognize that all property has an intellectual foundation in the human mind. Ayn Rand recognized this explicitly in her essay on patents and copyrights. She opens it with this sentence that intellectual property rights are, quote, the implementation of the base of all property rights, a man's right to the product of his mind. In fact, we know that this is one of Ayn Rand's key philosophical achievements, right, was her discovery that man's mind is his basic means of survival. This is the theme of Atlas Shrugged, right, her most important novel. Right? So everything that humans use to live, everything must first be conceived in our minds, and then we must take actions to produce the thing that we have just thought about. So we have to take action to create it. Right? So for instance, you don't go into the woods and just find an awesome car lying there, right? Just to be picked up. Well, actually, sometimes you do go into the woods and find a car lying there, but that's not the car that you really want, right? And that actually proves the point, right? That if you want this car, Ferrari, uh, my, when I, whenever my children say, I want, you know, when they want me to do something, I always respond to them, I want a Ferrari, <laughs> um, right? So what, how do we get cars, right? We don't find them in the woods just ready for us to pick up and use the way that a, that a lion looks out on the Serengeti and sees a gazelle, his lunch, waiting for him. Um, um, so you have to create it. If someone had to think of a car, what does it mean to have a car? And someone had to think of the, having engines and wheels and the design of it. And, and then not just think about these things, but then act to produce and create them. And then not just act to produce and create them, but then enter into the free market, create the contracts and, and complex commercial negotiations with suppliers and part, part man, parts manufacturers and create the distribution mechanisms through car dealers and whatnot, ultimately so we can have and purchase cars, right? But this isn't just about technology. This is a basic truth about everything, right? Production, as Ayn Rand so uh, insightfully writes, production is the application of reason to the problem of survival. All values that we use to live our lives come from value-creating productive labor, which is guided by our rational minds, right? So the classic, farm, even a farm, you think of a farm, but we had to think of, all right, what soils is valuable for growing uh, uh, crops in? And what types of crops do we want? Do we want to eat wheat? 
Yes. Do we want to eat uh, kale? No, right? So, um, so the, and, and how do you grow wheat, right? How do you invent the mechanisms and the processes by which to grow? You have to invent a reaper and, uh, and to be able to cut it down and to husband this and then just sell it in the marketplace, right? Ultimately leading, of course, to what we now know as farms, right? Inventing the incredible tools that constituted what's called the Green Revolution, and that's the good Green Revolution, starting in the 1950s with the biotech evolution of crops and combined with machinery to make, to make possible six billion people living on this planet today. In sum, all values that people lose to live must be produced. They must be created. They must be created. And, and to emphasize this, even the processes by which things are produced themselves have to be conceived and then put into action through rationally guided thought, right? So as I emphasized, you think of growing crops. That doesn't get you a crop. You have to think of what are the means to get you those crops, how to plant the seeds, how often to water them, how often to fertilize them, how, then when to pick them, how you pick them, how you, how you process it. Everything, this, this is called husbandry, you know, farming had to be invented. In sum, there, is, there are no values in the world as such. By the way, this is another really important key philosophical insight by Ayn Rand. There are no values in the world as such. A value is only something that serves the goal of a person living their lives. Right? <clears throat> And a great point to make, and a great example that kind of brings this home, right? And as I get this from, I got this example from Greg Salmeri, right? Is to think of cropland, fecund soil in cropland versus sand in the desert, right? Now, if I asked you which one is a value, I think almost every one of you would say, which one is a value? You would say the farm, because that's where we can grow crops. But that's an error. It's an error automatically to think fecund soil is valuable in the desert is not, right? And, and by the way, it's, naturally, it's natural and understandable why you think the farm. I mean, food is the universal value. Um, and, and also in the discussions about property, farming is a, and is, is a classic kind of example in history. John Locke, all of his examples in the second treatise of value creating productive labor are farming examples. Um, and in fact, it's, it's rooted in the very metaphor uh, which comes from uh, natural rights philosophy, right? That you should be secured the fruits of your productive labors, right? The fruits of your labors. Fruit, you know, the things that you grow. Right? So why is it an error, though, to automatically assume that fecund soil in a farmland is a value in a desert? It's not. Well, because it depends upon what is your goal. What's the value you're trying to produce? If food is what you're trying to produce, yes, the farm is valuable. Can you put that back up on the screen? Thank you. The farm is valuable. But if you're trying to produce silicon chips, you don't want a farmland, you want desert, you want sand, you need silicon, right? The sand is a value. The farmland, the fecund soil, is not. Again, it depends upon what your goal is, the value that you're trying to achieve through your productive value-creating actions. So in sum, all property is rooted in the human mind. The values created for the specific goals of a leading, living a flourishing life, right? And then thus, who are innovators and creators? Well, these are the people who first thought of a new value, who first saw something that needed to be created that would make our lives better. And then they took the productive actions to actually create this new value in the world. They didn't just think of it. They actually then made it possible and made it real. And by the way, this is why the right to property right, is defined as the right to acquire, use, and dispose of material values. Now, that's Ayn Rand's definition of the right to property. And notice, it's all about the creation, of acquisition, use, and disposition in your life of material values, the values that you're creating. That is the exact same definition in the law. I teach that to my students when I teach property every year in law school, that what is property? It's the right to, and the courts have a slightly different definition, but it's always the right to exclusive acquisition, use, and disposal of some asset or thing in the world, right? So the creation of new inventions, of books, and of other material values are the essence, the foundation of what makes possible the creation of 
all types of property, right? We can't even have the core types of property that people think of when they think of what's classic property, like your tangible interests, like the food on your plate or the computer before you, without the invention of the technology that makes that possible, right? And this is reflected in all of the heroes of the Industrial Revolution, right? James Watt, who is, of course, the inventor of the first practical, usable steam engine. Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin, the first mechanized process by which we, we obtained uh, um, a, uh, so, uh, cotton. Um, Isaac Singer and, Eli uh, and, and, Eli and Elias Howe, who are um, two of the many inventors who contributed to ultimately inventing the sewing machine um, in the mid-19th century. Um, I, actually, that's, I'm, I, I did a big historical research project on the sewing machine. In patent law circles, I'm known as the sewing machine guy. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, I can tell you all about the sewing machine. It was the smartphone of its era. Uh, it was a, fu a fun fundamental foundational device that led to a huge patent war at the time called the sewing machine war. Um, really interesting story. Story. Um, Samuel Morse, of course, uh, we know Samuel Morse through Morse code, you know, the dot, 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 da, da, da. <laughs> but actually the reason why Samuel Morse invented Morse code is because he actually invented the telegraph, um, the electromagnetic telegraph on which the Morse, the Morse code, the code that's named after him, was transmitted on. Um, and for those of you who uh, have heard, oh, software shouldn't be uh, patentable, it's just mathematics, it's just binary code. Well, if you think of it, Morse code is binary code, right? It's dots and dashes. And he got a patent on it. It was, it, was, it, was, it was the fifth claim of his invention in his patent on the telegraph was his code that he used to transmit. So you can say, wrong, when someone says software is never patentable. You could say, we were patenting software in the 1840s. So, um, and, then, um, and then there's lots of people that you don't know about behind the scenes, like Thomas Blanchard, um, who I'm fairly confident a lot of people haven't heard here, but he was the inventor of machine tool parts and ultimately of the assembly line manufacturing process that comes to be known as American manufacturing. Um, which is the key to efficient production of, uh, and mass production of the goods that we have. And this is one of the things I love about my job is that I get to read about these people. I've got this book I'm reading now called Shaping Invention, Thomas Blanchard's Machinery and Patent Management in 19th Century America. I get totally stoked when I see titles like that. <laughs> so, so I'm buying that book. I'm reading it. So, and then Charles Goodyear. The, um, of course, you probably know of Goodyear because you know of Goodyear uh, Tire and Rubber Company, right? But actually... Charles Goodyear has nothing to do with the tire company. It was named after him. He never manufactured one piece of rubber in his entire life. But he did invent the process in the 1830s for what's called vulcanized rubber, which is what makes rubber a, a usable material in the real world. And he was a crazy inventor. He didn't want to manufacture. So using his property rights and his new innovation, he licensed it to other people. He said, you manufacture it. You just pay me my licensing fee, my royalties, so I can continue to invent new types of rubber. I mean, he loved rubber. He wrote, he wrote a whole treatise on all of the different ways you can use rubber. And just to show you how cool rubber was, he had it bound in rubber. So, I mean, this, he was your classic the crazy inventor. It's awesome. So, um, and then, you know, these are all early, uh, you know, er, um, late 18th, early 19th century, but this continues up into the, the, uh, the later 19th century, right? Of course, uh, Thomas Edison, we all know Thomas Edison, the great inventor, about 1,200 patents, invents electrical distribution systems, invents the phonograph, what we call the record player, invents the first practical incandescent light bulb, by the way, he didn't invent the light bulb. He invented the first practical, usable light bulb, the first light bulb that actually functioned and worked. Um, and then, by the way, same with James Watt. James Watt didn't invent the steam engine. He invented the first practical, usable steam engine. He figured out how to build upon the Newcomb steam engine, which would have been invented before him, by coming up with the idea of a separate condenser with a governor that controlled the, the condensation and the heat rates. Um, and of course, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of uh, telephonic communications, um, <clears throat> the foundation of the whole Bell system, um, and the Wright brothers, the inventor of the airplanes, and of course, Leo Bakeland, someone, of course, you may not have heard of himself, but you, of course, you know his products, they're universal, or a minimum, you've heard of his invention. He named it after himself. He called it Bakelite. Um, he's the inventor of the very first plastic. In, uh, which, which he got a patent on in the early 20th century. In fact, he was a he, Dutch chemist. He came to the United States because he wanted to engage in the practical, real-world, innovative deployment of inventions into practical, real-world technologies. And that's why he came to the United States and got a patent in the United States. Um, and so on and so on. I don't have any more pictures now that, uh, into the 20th century because now we're under copyright and I, and, and I could not get permission uh, <laughs> to, uh, in the short time that I had to put together my PowerPoint slides. Um, so, but 
this continued into the heroes of the digital revolution and the biotech revolution today. Um, and for those of you who are interested and may, may want to follow me on Twitter, on Twitter I do a, on this date in innovation history, and I always post some, some patent. Today, by the way, is the anniversary of, uh, of one of the very early patents on the automobile issued in 1895 to a man named DeRay. So, um, so it's just kind of a neat way to see how patents and, and, and innovation secured by patents underlies everything that we have today. And why? Because this is what it means to protect property, to protect the creation of the new values that are necessary for us to live. It's fundamentally part of what it means to have a right to life. Now, this isn't just theory. This is also practice. And this is the important point about the history and economics. All of the heroes that I just mentioned and surveyed for you were made possible because they lived and worked in the United States. And this was key and fundamental to their work. The United States was the very first country in the entire world, in human history, to recognize property rights and in inventions and creative works, what we now call patents and copyrights. And in fact, it's in the Constitution it's in the U.S. Constitution. And so the U.S. Constitution is actually the very first time in human history that the right of inventors and creators is recognized in a founding document of an entire country. It's called the Patent and Copyright Clause. It's in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution. This is, uh, Article 1 is, is, is the section, of, is, the, is the portion of the Constitution that addresses Congress. Article 2 is the executive. Article 3 is the judiciary. Um, and Section 8 are the powers granted to Congress. And, and Clause 8 is it's up there. It says, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And by the way, as an aside, this is the very only place in the entire Constitution proper, so pre-Bill of Rights, the Constitution that was written in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, where the word right is even used. This shows you how they understood this point. Patents and copyrights from the get-go were part of what historians and political scientists sometimes refer to as American exceptionalism and what we know, right, as the fundamental moral commitment to protecting individual rights of life, liberty, and property. Property including all property, both in intellectual property as recognized in the Constitution, as well as property rights in land and other goods at that time. Now, it, wasn't, it isn't just in the Constitution. I mean, it's in the Constitution because the founders recognized this, right? In fact, most American founders understood that patents and copyrights were not just monopoly grants you know, that, we, that, the, that the government or the state gives out as largesse to inventors and creators. It's not just the carrot that we dangle in front of people in order to get them to invent, and that's all we want them to do, that this is a property right. And this is reflected in their very own personal actions. So George Washington... George Washington, the father of our country, the first president, um, he was what we would now call an angel investor. An angel investor, for those who know, is someone who's wealthy who actually, as an individual, gives, uh, you know, uh, um, um, doesn't give money, <laughs> uh, you know, funds research activities so that they will get a profit in, in what, what comes out of it of new inventors. He was an angel investor of an early um, uh, Virginia um, inventor, uh, James Rumsey, who was uh, working on steamboat technologies. And there's a model of, uh, of, of uh, James Rumsey's steamboat. But more, even more than that, right, he actually respected patent rights. He licensed the use of a patent um, in a technology that he used in his mill um, in the 1790s. And you can still visit this mill at Mount Vernon, his estate. That's a picture of, the, uh, um, of the, his mill in Mount Vernon. So he even respected patent rights himself individually. He didn't have to do that. He could have just taken it if he wanted to. Um, the inventor probably would have never figured it out because he would have had to get inside the mill. Um, but he chose to respect the property rights, the justly secured property rights to that innovator. And even at the Constitutional Convention more generally, 
these were not just theoretical statesmen schooled in the history of Athens and democracy and, and read in the natural rights thinkers of the 17th and 18th centuries. They were practical statesmen as well. And so they were visited by innovators and creators at the convention who explained to them the importance of the need to protect their rights. So John Fitch did a very famous demonstration of his steamboat to the Constitutional Convention delegates. He actually took them out to the river and showed them his steamboat at the time uh, specifically. And part of it was specifically to show them, like, look, I cannot produce this type of technology if I do not have my productive value creating labors secured to me in the ultimate product. And also Noah Webster, um, <clears throat> Noah Webster, who authored the very first American dictionary. That's why we have Webster's Dictionary today. Um, very famously went to uh, the Constitutional Convention as well in 1787 and explained to them how he was unable to secure his, his dictionary, given the varying rights between the different states as to whether they protected copyrights or not. That he, he had a national product here that needed to prote be protected by national laws through the new federal government. John Fitch's point was the same way. Steamboats travel between the states. So, so states can't provide effectual proper protections for these property rights. And then James Madison, father of the Constitution, because he wrote the notes at the Constitutional Convention that we all now rely upon an interpretation of understanding what, what, the, what the founders were achieving. In Federalist number 43, for those who don't know, the Federalist essays were essays published in, New, in the New York newspaper um, between 1787 and 1789 during what time it was called the ratification debates, when the Constitution was presented to the states, which precipitated a vociferous debate at that time about whether this Constitution should be adopted or not. And the Federalist Papers were essays um, uh, that justified the Constitution. And uh, in Federalist number 43, Madison discusses the patent and copyright clause. Um, and after talking about the rights of, of copyright uh, owners and how they had been secured in England at that time, and he says this was legitimate, um, he goes on to say, the right to useful invention seems with equal reason to belong to the inventors, end quote. And that the quote, the public good fully coincides in both cases, copyrights and patents, with the claims of individuals, unquote, right? That, and this is, by the way, consistent with you protect individual rights, you protect the rights of life, liberty, and property, and this is the foundation in securing to individuals a flourishing life that you thus create the basis for a flourishing society, a growing flourishing society. And thus he concludes, quote, the utility of this power will scarcely be questioned, unquote. Of course, Madison could not foresee 200 years later when it is always questioned. Um, <laughs> but at that time, you know, he, he, he said, look, this is, this is clear why we put this in the Constitution. There should be zero doubt about this. In fact, there was no debate about this provision at the Constitutional, Constitutional Convention. It was proposed and then immediately voted on unanimously and sent to the uh, Committee on Style to be written up to be put into the Constitution. So all we have is unanimously approved. <laughs> uh, there's no debate about it whatsoever. And as further evidence of how serious that the uh, American founders took the protection of inventions and creative works uh, through patents and copyright laws. The very, when, when the first Congress meets in 1790 under the Constitution, the very first Congress, some of the very first laws that they immediately enact are the Patent Act of 1790 and the Copyright Act of 1790. Now, to give you a context for this, Congress spent about three months debating on whether to call George Washington His Excellency or Mr. President. <laughs> but they immediately enacted the patent and copyright laws because they knew that this was fundamental to what it meant to have a proper society protecting the rights of life, liberty, and property. <clears throat> and then following from this, of course, the courts repeatedly throughout the late 18th and then early 19th centuries and up onward in the United States protected patents and copyrights exactly on these grounds as property rights that follow from productive value-creating labor. Um, in fact, they, it's where you often find the metaphor, the famous natural rights metaphor of securing to people the fruits of their labor. Of course, they usually framed it uh, in intellectual terms. They would often talk about the fruits of intellectual labor as being essential and key. And it's producing property rights that are the exact same as property rights in crops and in homes and in other types of property that people interact with all the time. <clears throat> and this is why Abraham Lincoln... Um, in, in a speech in 1858, very famously said, the patent system 
added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. What an eloquent phrase that captures morally exactly what is happening when you secure an inventor's rights to the products of their productive value-creating labors, right? And in fact, in this speech, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln identified three great innovations in the history of humanity. So in the speech, he talked about the whole history of humanity. He said there were three great innovations in the history of humanity. Writing and printing was the first one. The discovery of America was the second. And enacting patent laws was the third. <laughs> and this is then when he says, because it secured the fruits of, uh, uh, or added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. And by the way, for Lincoln, this wasn't just a mere theoretical statement. He knew exactly of what he was talking about. Because Lincoln, to this day, is our only president who obtained a patent on an invention of his. Um, it was issued uh, in 1849, and the anniversary of it was May 2nd. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so just several weeks ago, you didn't realize how significant May 22nd was. Now you know, right? And so this is, you, can, you get these patent drawings, and you can see, right, so there's Abraham Lincoln, and it's a method of buoying vehicles. So it was a method of raising ships um, over, um, here, I'll, I'll um, oh, let me go back. Uh, it's a method of raising ships over, uh, over, uh, uh, over um, shoals, and you can see May 22nd, 1849. Um, the uh, May 22nd is also another famous anniversary. You probably don't know this, but it's also the anniversary of the Wright brothers receiving their patent in 1906 on the on their invention of the flying machine. So you see Orville and Wilbur Wright flying machine, May 22nd, 1906. There's their signatures. This is the actual patent drawing here. I'll flip it for you so you can see it a little better. See, there's their, there's their famous airplane as, as drawn in their patent application for which they received uh, protections for, right? Now, the result of, of course, this type of fundamental protections of the creation of new technology as property rights, and justly so, was an explosion in productivity that we now look back upon and call the Industrial Revolution, right? Um, and, excuse me, and by the way, as objectivists, we look at this and say, no duh, because what, what we learned from Ayn Rand, right, was the moral is the practical, right? One of the, one of the sub-themes, for instance, of The Fountainhead, her, her earlier novel, to be, to be moral and to do the right thing leads to success and a flourishing life, right? And this is one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution, which starts in England, actually, in the 18th century. James Watt was an English inventor. Uh, and in fact, he famously came up with his innovation when he had a flash of genius walking through a field. He was an innovator, um, uh, or he was a researcher at a university. He was kind of walking through a field thinking, and, you know, thinking about um, steam engines and the problems with the Newcomb steam engine and how to fix it, and he figured out separate condensers. And that's what leads to his very famous uh, invention. He gets a patent in England. But the problem is in England, patents were viewed as monopoly rights. They were viewed as a grant from the crown. And it was viewed as just a, a mechanism by, by which the crown uh, advanced the economic policies of the, of the kingdom. They were not viewed as property rights. And this is one of the key uh, differences between the U.S. approach and the English approach, and it's a key factor in why the Industrial Revolution shifts from England to the United States. Because Watt received this personal grant from the Crown, he couldn't trade with it as a property right, because it was a personal monopoly privilege grant to him from the crown as an inventor. So he couldn't trade with it. So he actually had to team up with other people. Some of you may know Bolton. Bolton was a business person that he had to team up with as a, uh, as a way of commercializing his innovation, because he wasn't a business person. But in the United States, inventors could embrace, as with their property rights, the division of labor and specialization, the key insight of Adam Smith in, um, in, uh, in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, and therefore embrace the efficiencies that are achieved through a free market where property rights are traded between individuals to, uh, through the trader principle for win-win results. That's Charles Goodyear, right? He wanted to be a crazy inventor. He didn't want to manufacture, and he was able to do so because he had a property right. Same with Elias Howe, who invented the lock stitch in, in the sewing machine. He was just a destitute inventor. He, didn't, he licensed his invention. And same with Thomas Edison. He was a career inventor. He didn't engage in productive enterprises until much later in his life. And in fact, he was an awful business 
businessman. He was an example of someone who should have stayed as an inventor. Henry Ford, who gave, uh, who, who gave Edison millions of dollars in personal unsecured loans and lost almost all that money, once famously said of Edison, he's the world's greatest inventor and the world's worst businessman. Right? We want inventors doing what inventors do best, inventing. And we want business persons doing what they do best, doing business. And the two should work through commercial exchanges. And so the, this is not, it's not a surprise then that the, that the uh, Industrial Revolution shifts to the United States. And this has been uh, exemplified in a recent article published um, in the Law Review at my, uh, at my university because it was through a conference that I sponsored through my Intellectual Property Center. Um, so by uh, a political scientist at, um, at Stanford, Steve Haber, uh, uh, art, uh, wrote this article that surveyed the economic and historical evidence um, uh, about the role of patents in growing economies. And, and, um, and he has in this this pretty cool little chart of comparison of GDP between the United Kingdom, USA, and Brazil um, from 1700 up to 1913. Um, 19, uh, and you can see in 1700, Brazil and the United States had identical GDP almost, right? <laughs> identical GDP. Um, and then, um, by the 19th century, this completely radically changes, right? You know, that the United States starts to skyrocket and even more and more and more. Um, and in fact, this was widely recognized even at the time. So in 1850, right, where you can see where we are now outgrowing Brazil. And by the way, one of the key differences between us and Brazil um, in, in these early years was that we secured patents. They did not. They did not have patent rights, or offered them to people, among other things, but that was one of the, um, uh, the, the, one of the factors to talked about in his, um, in his uh, paper. So in 1850, at the Crystal Palace Exposition in, in, in London, which is the very first World's Fair, um, the very first World's Fair, 1850, the United States marvels the world with our innovations. This was when Charles Goodyear's rubber, Samuel Morse's telegraph, Elias Howe and, and Isaac Singer's sewing machine, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, Samuel Colt's repeating firearm, patented by the way, um, you know, uh, and so on and so on, were put on display to the world. And, the United, and, and, and other countries were just amazed at this. And why were they amazed? Well, we've lost this context. Let me reestablish for you. 1850. So this is, this is 60 years after the start of the first Congress in 1790, right? 60 years. What were we like in 1790? We were a poor country. We were primarily agrarian in, 1690, in 1790. I'm sorry, I said 1690. In, in 1790. Um, we had been devastated by a decade-long war with one of the greatest economic and military powers in the world, England. We had been devastated for then another following decade of internecine fights under the Articles of Confederation between the different states as they all vied with each other. And it turned out to be a disaster econo uh, economically and politically, which is why we got the Constitutional Convention of 1787. So we were completely destitute as a country in the 1780s. And in fact, at that time, England was predicting that we were going to come begging back to be, to please let us back into the Commonwealth mother. We're sorry, you know, like a, like a, like a teenager, an upstart teenager who got uppity and, <laughs> and, uh, and is punished. Um, but 60 years later, we are showing the world what our system of government and what it means to protect the rights to life, liberty, and property, what comes from that, and especially intellectual property. And as a result of that, actually, and then later in the 19th century, a lot of countries actually said, it must be their patent system, because everyone that, 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 is, that, it, that had their innovations on display at the, at the Crystal Palace, these were all patented. So they all copied our patent system. Japan and all these other countries copied our patent system. Um, so, and, and that had a small effect in terms of prompting more innovation there. But of course, they didn't adopt the other changes that they needed, uh, rule of law, protection of broad uh, individual rights throughout other areas. Areas of the, of the society and things of that sort. But this continues up through today. The patent system served as the foundation of the digital revolution and the biotech revolution. The basic packet switching technology, for those who are tech geeks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The packet switching technology that is the foundation of the entire internet was a patented uh, technology. It's a patent on it. And as I already mentioned, there was a patent on the transistor. There was a patent on the integrated circuit. These were property rights that drove the tech, the tech in, uh, revolution and then the biotech revolution of our day, where we are genetically modifying organisms, creating from the protein up uh, treatments that cure ills that have been the scourge of humankind for 
centuries, if not millennia, right? So the ex what, what's the point of all of this is the exact same historical and economic evidence that advocates for the free market use to justify property rights generally also justifies equally intellectual property. You, get, you have the exact same correlations, the exact same evidence, the exact same growth of flourishing societies that secure strong patent rights and property rights to inventors and creators. Again, now, as I emphasize, it's not the only thing, right? It's not like you can say, well, we just create a patent system, but we, you know, but we you know, have you know, no rule of law, total tyranny, <laughs> but we have patents. No, it's, what, the point is that patents, like property rights and land and other things, are a key variable, a key factor in growing economies and flourishing lives as long as it's part of the rule of law stable and effective political institutions, and, um, and broadly a system that protects the rights of life, liberty, property, and contract in other areas. And this is repeatedly proven um, by other studies. So, um, so uh, uh, Professor Haber's um, article, which is really nice because it's only like 20 or 25 pages, which is awesome because most law review articles are like 80 pages. Um, and um, so he, he's just surveying the historical and economic evidence, right? So he, um, he, uh, he took, he looked at a couple different um, indexes of intellectual property protections throughout the world. And then, he, and then he took a couple indexes of economic growth and he put them together. And lo and behold, what do you get? Is you get a correlation. Uh, between enforceable patent rights and GDP. Um, so, um, wrong button. So, so these are so um, these are these are each of these points is a uh, non-oil based economy in the country. Um, and as you can see, the strong, uh, the more effective and stable property rights that they are being provided in innovation, and you get also more growth in GDP. Um, and so, this is the exact type of similar type of evidence that we appeal to. Um, in addition to our philosophic moral justifications to show on both that the moral is the practical, the foundational insight from Ayn Rand. And so patents and intellectual property rights are based in the explicit legal recognition that all material values that serve a flourishing human life are the product of an individual's rational mind and the productive actions that follow from it. This is, in fact, one of the key moral achievements of the founders in creating the Constitution and in creating this country. We, uh, and it cannot be emphasized enough because a lot of people paper over this um, with, uh, with statements like, well, the patent system comes from England. Yeah, well, we came from England. <laughs> Our country came from England. Um, but we're not the same as England, right? We broke from them not just in our system of government and in the institutions that we had in the rule of law and protection of the rights of life, liberty, and property. We also broke with them with respect to our, uh, with the protection of intellectual property. And this is ultimately reflected, as I said, in the Constitution itself, which secured in the U.S. as property rights, along with all other individual rights under the rule of law, the innovations and creations of the types of innovators and creators who make all of our lives possible. And this is the indisputable moral foundation that gave birth to the revolution in technological innovation that then itself led to the explosion in economic growth that we now call the Industrial Revolution, and of which we are in the city um, that was a focal point of that in the 19th century. And then moving into the 20th century, it served as the spur for what becomes the the digital revolution and the personal computer revolution, eventually the biotech revolution, and hopefully for the sake of our lives and a free society in which we want to live and flourish, we can only hope that intellectual property rights will continue to be there in the next wave of innovation in the years to come. So thank you. So, um, <clears throat> awesome. Lots of, see, everyone has tons of questions when it comes to intellectual property. It's why I, I said I'm doing 45 minutes of question and answer. <laughs> yes. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us some of uh, like your favorite uh, debates on like length and type of protections and the decisions that were made. Um, so, all right, so your, your, your question is, is asking about um, 
what are some of the issues that went into what types of inventions we'll protect, and also um, the, the time limit, the term. Um, OK, uh, it's a great question. Um, so um, the, 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 the US patent statutes provided from the very get-go that you can get a patent on a, on, um, on, a, on, a, on a product that you make, whether it's a machine or a composition of matter. Um, or a process. Um, it's a little more technical than that, but those are basically the, 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 the different um, protections. And in fact, this is another example of the way that we broke with England, um, because England only protected machines and products. You couldn't protect processes in, in, in England. But we recognized, remember I said, even husbandry had to be invented. Husbandry is a value that has to be invented, the process of farming. We recognized that processes were just as much a value <laughs> that led to the creation of values as other things. So we said, we are going to protect processes. In fact, the very first patent that issues um, in, in, to an inventor in this country is a method of making potash, uh, a method of making product, a process. So we, through the years, through the centuries, the 200 plus years of the patent system, have taken a very forward-looking approach to the, all values that are created should be secure. In fact, there's a very famous uh, sentence from um, the congressional debates that led to uh, the 1952 uh, Patent Act, uh, um, one of the, the, the time, one of the last times that the Congress really did a radical revision of the patent laws, where one of the congresspersons said, um, the patent system should protect, quote, everything made by man under the sun. <laughs> um, and that's exactly right. In fact, this is one of the reasons why the United States has had what, what is referred to as the gold standard patent system. Uh, it's a term that's used with respect to identifying our patent system because we were there to protect the innovation that was created that was not foreseeable, that was, that was radical, that pushed the envelope. And our, our, pat, and we, our courts and our, and, 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 and our legislature, the Congress, consistently said that is what should be protected. Because people constantly said, that's not protectable. That's not a new invention. And we said, yes. In fact, this is specifically the case with respect to digital technology and biotech. So there are two very famous Supreme Court decisions from 1980 and 1981, where in 1980 is Diamond v. Shocker Barty, um, which involved a genetically modified bacteria that could eat oil. And the person applied for a patent on it. And the patent office said, you can't patent that. That's life. And the person went all up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, this is a manufactured new thing. This is a, something made by someone. This is patentable. This is exactly what the patent system is supposed to be for. And that single court decision is identified by universally by, econom by economists as the starting point for the biotech revolution in the United States. Because immediately after that decision, Billions of dollars flowed into R&D, um, to biotech researchers in the United States, because they said, we can get secured for us the fruits of our productive research labors um, to come up with new innovations. The rest of the world said no. And in fact, there was a very famous uh, invention called the Onco Mouse. It was invented at Harvard. It was, a, it was a mouse that was genetically engineered to get cancer, invaluable for, getting, for doing cancer research. A mouse guaranteed to get cancer. <laughs> Poor mouse. <laughs> but. Um, in the United States, we said, of course you can patent that. Every other country in the world said no for at least 10 or 15 years. And so that's exactly what the patent system is there for, the new values, the new creations. Same with, uh, as I said, there were two court decisions. The other one was um, uh, um, Diamond v. Deere in 1981 that involved a computer program used to run a, um, a, a rubber, uh, vulcanizing rubber process, where the Supreme Court said, you can patent that. A computer program is a patentable invention as long as it's part of a product or process that's used in the world. And, um, and these were foundational uh, decisions that drove the revolutions that we have today. Now, when it comes to time limits, it's a very, very complicated issue, exactly why time limits are the way they are. You should have time limits in intellectual property. Ayn Rand talks about them very briefly in her essay, Patents and Copyrights. I actually did an, uh, an entire uh, talk on time limits and patents and copyrights at a past OCON. So I would just defer you, or refer you to that because it's a long issue. It's very complicated philosophically. Um, and um, uh, it really deserves a full treatment that I can't give in a question and answer period. So, but they're great questions. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Adam. That was a great talk. Um, could you give us some indication of the kinds of arguments that libertarians give against uh, patent, uh, patents and copyrights? And how widespread is this among people who call themselves libertarians? Thanks. Yeah, so um, it's a very, um, it, it is very widespread. Um, it's it's um, many, many, many libertarians, not all, but many libertarians uh, today um, are very vociferously opposed to intellectual property. Um, and, they, uh, and they primarily are because they, they approach uh, property from uh, an economic and a utilitarian framework. Um, 
And I talk, about, I talk a little bit about this, actually, more than a little. I, I addressed this issue in that prior talk from Ocon and securing the values of the mind. Um, and so there, but just to give you a quick overview, so what they say is, well, the reason why we have property rights is to settle disputes between scarce resources in the world. So you know, a piece of, of land can't be used at the same time in the same way by two different people. So there's going to be a dispute over that. So you resol and disputes are inefficient. They waste resources, and, um, and um, so in order to incentivize the value maximizing uses of property and to re quickly resolve disputes, we, we grant property rights to people. Um, you, know, you can already see there's a lot of uh, you know, false moral assumptions in it. Um, and so they start from this premise. Scarcity is the basis of property, and this is part of the problem is that it, technological inventions and, and books aren't scarce, right? I can copy your book or I can copy your invention, and it doesn't take away your invention or book, right? It doesn't deplete you from yours. The copy doesn't. And it doesn't prevent you from using yours. So they say, see? So there's no reason for property here. Um, of course, the problem is, is, that, they're, um, is that they're committing um, a classic fallacy of, kind of, 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 of starting in the middle. And the, question to ask, and the question I always ask them is, well, where did those resources come from that people are having conflicts over in the first place? Where did those come from? As I say, you don't find cars in the, tr in the forest, right? Or more importantly, here's a really good historical example. Oil was literally bubbling up from the ground here in Pennsylvania for centuries. And there was never a conflict over it, ever, <laughs> until the 19th century. All of a sudden, there's tons of conflicts over oil in the 19th century. Oh, is that just like magical coincidence? No, it's because of the invention of combustion engines and the invention of, of other machines that required the use of oil now as a value. It was converted into a value. And as a result of that, the people who were drawing it from the ground had a right to it. Had, and people who had invented the technology to draw it from the ground and to use it in those combustion engines had a right to that. And that's the basis point. And if you start from that foundation of where property rights come from, as opposed to the disputes of over, uh, over property rights, I think that you can get at what the, what the, what the fundamental flaw is in their thinking. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. That's not the only one. There's a lot of other ones. But that's the dominant uh, approach that, and the, the dominant argument that one hears a lot from them. Yes? Uh, OK. Uh, Richard from our live stream asked, the American Invents Act passed several years ago changed to a first to file for patents. Mm -hmm. However, the U.S. Constitution can be taken to mean a patent is to be granted to first to invent. Yes. Does this mean that patents granted under the American Invents Act are invalid? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so it's a great question. So for, so for those who uh, don't know, a little context here. So that we passed another law in, in 2011, uh, tangentially called the American Invents Act, because it did the exact opposite. Um, and um, and they, were, they changed a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the rules in the patent system, um, mostly for the bad. Um, and in fact, I was involved in that process, because I was on the Hill giving, uh, you know, talking with congressional staffers and doing debates, telling them you shouldn't be doing this. But one of the biggest changes that they made was they shifted us to a, from a first to invent, um, where we rewarded uh, the inventor for their productive labors, justly rewarded them by recognizing the fruits of their productive labors, to a, what's called a first to file, which is what the rest of the world has. This is what's what England had in the 18th century, which again, which is what we broke from them from by saying, we're not just going to give the patent to the person who is, happens to be the first person to file at the patent office. We're going to actually give the patent to the first person who actually invented it, who created this new value. Um, because that is the person who engaged in the productive labors that justify a property right being secured to that person. Again, it is fundamental to the property rights perspective, the same ju foundational justification for why we recognize property rights in land and other things. It's the first person who engages in the productive labor with respect to a piece of land or another type of personal asset, like, a, like, a, like making a chair or something, is the person who gets the property right in that. Um, and so this is very much part and parcel of the degradation of our patent system, where we're shifting away from a property rights perspective and toward an approach to patents like other countries have, um, which they view patents not as property rights, but as economic regulatory entitlements that are granted to people simply for the benefit of, uh, of growing our economies because that's part of our, the government's job is to shepherd the economic development of the, of, 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 of the, uh, of the country. In fact, that was one of the justifications for making this shift, was that we have to harmonize our, our laws with the rest of the world. Um, to which a lot of us said, I mean, yeah, um, you know, harmonization can be good, 
but it's only good if you're raising protections and providing legitimate protections, not lowering the bar. Um, and so this is a fundamental problem, um, and it's going to need to be addressed. Um, and I was one of the people on the Hill actually arguing that it was actually unconstitutional because the Constitution, as you may remember uh, in my slides, uh, I won't jump back because it's too far back, says, uh, you know, that it says the exclusive right should be granted to the inventor, not the first to file, but the inventor. <laughs> An inventor is the first person who comes up with something. Um, so they, um, they got around this problem in response to these arguments by fudging it a little bit. And they, so what the American Vents Act says is the first inventor to file. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, so they, they fudged it a little. And so that's what makes the patents that have been conferred um, since then legitimate and valid. Um, but um, we haven't had an instant yet, instance yet where you have an inventor who was beaten to the patent office by someone else. That will create the first test case for whether this is constitutional or not. Um, it won't, and that won't invalidate the past patents as long as the past patents actually issued to actual inventors, and that has actually occurred at least since then. But the framing and the shifting away from thinking of this as a property right system to an economic re uh, uh, regulation system is significant um, and is undermining our, our, um, our patent system and is actually having a negative impact. Um, studies have shown that, um, that venture capital f uh, funding for, um, um, for, for new startups is drying up in this country. I mean, part of it is part of the larger economic regulatory problems, but part of it is because patents have been sub substantially weakened in this country as a result of the changes made to the patent system in 2011 through the American Vents Act. Uh, next question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so I've heard of so-called patent trolls, which are, I believe, law firms that purchase um, the patents from other people mm -hmm. and then sue those who uh, make similar inventions. Yeah. So those people are neither inventors nor business people, and mm -hmm. it looks to me almost as if they were not doing anything productive, really. Yeah. So uh, do you agree that that might be an abuse of the patent system, and would you know what could be done about it? All right, so it's a great question because this is an issue that is, is prevalent in, in, in the popular um, uh, media today and in, in, in the policy debates over patent system is this thing is, is a debate over what's called patent trolls. Um, I also did a talk on this at, OCA, at the last OCON called the Smartphone Wars and Patent Trolls, What They Mean to You. Um, so um, I, I can't repeat the co whole content of that, but what I will say is that you need to be very careful and wary of when you hear terms being used in the popular media or in, or in, the, in, in, in the culture writ large. You need to think, okay, what is that term and what it's really getting at? Um, so for instance, you, would be, you'd be, you might be surprised to learn that the patent troll is actually not defined. And it's term shifts depending upon um, who you're talking to and what paper you're reading. Um, and um, and uh, it, so it has been used to include individual inventors, universities like University of Wisconsin, Caltech, Carnegie Mellon have all been called patent trolls. Uh, it's, been used, it, uh, it's been used to attack um, companies that engage in patent licensing. Um, and um, it's been used to attack startups and other companies. Now, the, the only thing that unites all of those different people in these instances is that they don't manufacture. But remember, this is a key point of the patent system is that you're not supposed to have to manufacture. You can use it like a property right. Just like if you have a property right in land, do you have to live on that parcel of land? No, you can, you can lease it out. You can become a landlord, right? And Make money by renting it to, pe to people through a property interest called a leasehold. I teach leaseholds in, um, in, uh, in my first year property class. By the way, for those of you who live in apartments, you may have thought your leases were contracts. They're not. They're property interests. They're slices of a property right. Um, and, um, and so this is a key aspect of what it means to have a functioning, successful patent system that is a property rights-based patent system is that people can trade and tra uh, uh, trade these property rights, patents, in the marketplace. It's called a secondary market. And in fact, in the 19th century, there was a vibrant secondary market in patents. They were being traded and sold between people, and there were patent aggregating companies that were aggregating them for purposes of efficient licensing to manufacturers and commercial distributors and things of that sort. Um, and this is economic historians like Zarina Khan um, and many others have repeatedly recognize that this was a key part of the success, the economic success of patents as the foundation for the Industrial Revolution in, uh, in this country. And so, in effect, patent troll is, represents very much a term on par with things like robber baron. It's a rhetorical epithet that has been used to attack patent owners um, to, for the purposes of undermining and destroying the very nature of what, our, of what makes our patent system Great. Now, are there some bad actors in the patent system? Yes. 
right? There are millions of patent owners, just like there's millions of property owners, right? I mean, so, and do sometimes people act badly with their property rights? Yeah, sometimes they do, right? Um, but just because the old man with the lead pipe chases the kids down the street saying, stay off my land, you kids, and we don't say, well, well let's get rid of trespass laws, right? <laughs> um, just because there's one, one out of, you know, tens of millions of patent owners who does something kind of, you know, improper with their property rights and uses it as a basis to, to undermine or hurt someone else doesn't mean that we get rid of or weaken the patent, patent system of their property rights. It means we use the other legal doctrines that are there to address those, peop those people, and, we, and, and that has been done. But it's been used as a rhetorical device to push legislation and to push court decisions that have fundamentally weakened the property rights and new innovation in this country over the past 10 years. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does, a, does an annual index of IP strengths among, among the world, um, ranking every country in the world in the strength of their IP protections. And for every year up until 2007, guess what country was number one in the U.S. Chamber uh, of Commerce's famous index of IP strength around the world? The United States. Guess where we are in 2017? We're 10th. We are now 10th. We have fallen one spot every year since 2007, and we're continuing to fall. Um, and in fact, I just, um, I'm publishing an article this month called Turning Gold to Lead about how a series of court decisions at the US Supreme Court, which has been caught up in the patent troll rhetoric, um, have fundamentally undermined the very function of our patent system as being a forward-looking uh, property rights system to protect new innovation, um, and that it, we are now shutting the door to new innovation. So we, found, we have a database of 1,700 patent applications for, the, for, for inventions in the biotech space and the high-tech space. Same invention, 1,700 patent applications. Those same patent applications were filed in China, European Union, which has a unified patent office, and the United States. And China and the European Union all granted the patent application. The United States rejected it. I mean, and these are fundamental treatments in cancer and diabetes. Um, and, um, and in fact, uh, when you talk to people who actually work with patents today in the marketplace, um, the, you know, and if you have a patent now, um, and you're gauging in commercial activity in the marketplace, one of the first things that people say to you now is not, do you have a US patent? They say, do you have a German patent or a Chinese patent? Because the rights, the property right protections in the US patent systems have been so degraded through the, uh, the, uh, this, this battle against them, this push against them, where you, and partially because you've had this conjoining of the, libertarian, uh, the libertarians on the you know, as alleged advocates for the free market and the left, who hate property rights more generally, have joined saying, yes, patents are bad. And when you have that type of joining of forces, along with a lot of companies who have a lot of, who don't have patent-based business models, who and therefore view in a very short-term pragmatic way that patents as are a bulwark against their business models, that, so they're, they're, they're funding a lot of lobbying and, and they're funding a lot of strategic uh, litigation, um, you, you've had this kind of perfect storm. And, it's, and, we're, and, it's, and that's why it's, this is a really serious concern right now. Really serious. I'm going to be testifying to Congress actually on Tuesday about exactly this issue, Tuesday morning. So, uh, and so uh, um, uh, about one of these uh, bad court decisions that just came down a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Adam. Uh, great talk. My question in regards to uh, intellectual property right protection. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the U.S. used to be at the top. We're, you know, falling down. Uh, but I do find that, that uh, protection of, of intellectual rights are very difficult. And certain areas in industries, such as you know, music and entertainment, you know, uh, those rights are sort of like non-existent because the government cannot guarantee that they'll be protected. Mm -hmm. So my question will be, uh, is there an alternative to protecting rights? Um, you know, Steve Jobs created the iTunes store and it sort of like helped with the protection of those rights because it's convenient. Uh, it's really a moral issue that people, mm -hmm. some people are fine with not, with stealing. Uh, so I was thinking, can we think of another way of, instead of relying on the government to protect those intellectual rights, uh, is there something else that can be done? That's a great question because you're getting a, a really important issue about what does it mean to protect intellectual property as property, 
right? Because that's not relying on the government any more than it is to rely on the government to protect your title deed in your land, which you want to then want to license to someone to come across on, with an easement and give a free uh, future interest to through a will and give you know drilling rights a thousand feet under the ground. So you have layers of different uses and different rights, and 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 this is all managed through your contracts and through your or conveyances, as we say in, in, in the law, of your property interests. Um, property is a is is a right of of exclusive you know use and disp in, in, in disposal, and so it's a platform by which you then have the free freedom to make the choices of how to dispose of your interests as long as your interests are appropriately protected as property rights, and the, and that's the government's job to do that. Um, and so this is really important. A lot of people think of patents and copyrights as incentivizing new innovation. And that's true, right? It does. Because if you, once you say to someone, we will protect the fruits of your productive labors, of course they're going to engage in productive labor because they know that they, you have a just system in which they live, right? But property rights do more than that, right? Because it's not just about incentivizing because you can incentivize through awards and grants and other types of things of that sort. Um, but the reason why you want property rights is because property rights even do more on the back end because they provide the platform for commercial be, uh, activity which people can develop new business models, new ways of transacting in the marketplace. And in fact, this is one of the key features of patents is that it doesn't just lead to follow on technical, technological innovation, it, fall, it leads to commercial innovation because the people who have these property rights are free then to come up with new business models for figuring out ways to sell and transact their products in the marketplace so they can sell at different prices. Right? You, can, you, 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 may have, you have less money than a millionaire, so you will only be willing to pay five cents, and a millionaire would be willing to pay $10. So they can choose to sell at those different prices, um, if the antitrust laws allow them now. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, um, and, and, it, and this is actually the story in the, in the history of innovation. So for instance, Isaac Singer, um, he was an innovator, not just with coming up with new part aspects of the of the sewing machine. He was a commercial innovator. He invented um, he um, invented um, um, uh, he was the uh, one of the innovators for kind of, um, kind of com uh, wide scale commercial um, sale to com consumers. Um, he was so he was a former opera singer, and he knew like you had to be flashy and to really get people excited about things. Um, so you know, this was not original to Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. I was about to say Bill Gates, the exact opposite. <laughs> so um, the uh, and so um, he uh, so he and he knew that women were the ones who were going to be using the sewing machine in the, 18, in, the in the mid 19th century. So he would set up displays in storefronts. He would rent storefronts where he would just have women operating a sewing machine which was utterly shocking to people at the time, a woman operating a machine. And huge crowds would gather to watch this woman operating this machine as she would be sewing uh, a new, you know, new piece of clothing. And people got really excited about his sewing machine and said, wow, I want a sewing machine. But his sewing machine was also very expensive. It was like $125 in 1850s. That was a lot of money. So how do you get people to spend that much money money? Well, he, he invented installment purchase programs. So you put a small amount of money down and then pay a little bit over this period of a few months. He, he invented also the first trade leaseback program. Bring in any of my old Singer sewing machines. Bring in a competitor sewing machine. You'll get $50 off the price of a new Singer sewing machine. Right? This is why Singer is now, is now synonymous with sewing machines. It's not because of his inventive contributions. It was because of all of the new innovative commercial innovation that he engaged in that was made possible by securing to him his property rights and his contract rights, which is fundamental to what it means to protect these types of creations. That's what you want. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned Steve Jobs and Apple because the iPhone was invented in two... You know what? So everyone know when the iPhone was released? 2000, 2008. What? Seven, yeah, just 10 years ago. Seems like, oh my God, only, it's only 10 years old. You know when it was invented? No one knows this. 2003. Well, what do you so what do you think? For four years, Steve Jobs was sitting in at the Apple headquarters going, oh, I'm the only person in the world with an iPhone. <laughs> I mean, what do you think was happening during those four years? He was coming up with all, of, he was having to put into place the complex commercial um, uh, agreements and processes, the supply chains, manufacturers, and the component part manufacturers, and the distribution chains to make it possible to sell this 
to consumers in the marketplace. And that's exactly what property rights do. And it took four years to set that up, right? You know, he had to convince DuPont to invent Gorilla Glass, which is the innovative glass used in the iPhone and now all smartphones. He had to set, create the commercial agreements with the manufacturers in China and, and in other countries. By the way, that's why your iPhone doesn't, it says designed in Cupertino. It doesn't say manufactured in Cupertino, all right? Um, you know, he achieved the efficiencies through the free market. And in fact, if you had said to, you know, tech geeks like me in 1990, yeah, there's going to be Apple stores where people are going to be buying Apple products at malls. I would have said to you, are you crazy? That's, that's not cool. <laughs> that's not hip. Right? That's not the way that Apple does things. But he also had, just like Singer, he innovated a new distribution model for his products in, uh, to get them into the hands of consumers at an affordable price that he could make millions and millions of dollars for himself and his company, and we and all of us are better off as the result of that. And so, it's, so that, is the, the, that is the importance of having the government protect these property rights, and that's what the government needs to do, because you're right, the government is not doing it, especially for creative works and copyrights. You know, all these debates about terms of copyrights and how long they last, that is, you know, when you talk to people in the creative industries, you know, they tell you, you know what the effective real life term of a copyright is? about 30 seconds, because that's how long it takes for a pirate to upload it to the internet and for it to be shared in the internet in millions of files around the world, and they're just, and they're, it's done at that point. You can't stop it. So, um, so you, know, you need more effective protection of copyrights on, in, in digital content on the internet. You need, we need to bring back the proper property rights protections for patents, and we will have, again, the type of economic activity and flourishing of, uh, and growth of new types of products and services that we have seen in this country in the 19th century and for much of the 20th century. Thank you. Yeah. So the Selden Auto patent is conventionally portrayed as a patent that should mm -hmm. not have happened and nearly crippled the auto industry. What's your view on the actual history? Oh, great question. Because just like with robber barons, right? You, whenever you talk to people like, oh, there were the robin barons in the 19th century. They were killing babies and, and, and enforcing people to work, you know, 36 hours a day. And you would say, uh, not that many hours. <laughs> um, so the exact same problems in, 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 the, in the history of patent law as well. There are tons of historical myths about patents and patent owners and what happened and what really went on. Um, and, um, and, and for those of you who don't know, Selden got a patent on, a, on, on, a, on an, he was one of the, there, there were hundreds of patents issuing on, on automobiles, just like there's hundreds and thousands of patents, hundreds or thousands of patents issuing on new technology like the smartphone today in the early uh, 20th century and late 19th century. Um, and Selden was someone who kind of aggregated a lot of these patents and had a patent himself, and he was a licensing um, um, entity. He, he didn't manufacture, he licensed his patent. And he got in a lot of litigation with manufacturers like Ford and others. Um, and so, and this, is, and this is often pointed to, oh, Selden was a patent troll. He was holding up automobile innovation. He was crushing this country's economy. Um, when you actually have historians actually go and take a look at this, and there's a really great individual, his name's Ron Katznelson. He's done these really incredible, in-depth historical uh, uh, um, uh, research economic research into actually what happened, and what were patents were like, what was the licensing activities, um, he found the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Um, you had, you know, you had, you know, growth in, in new automobile companies, hundreds of new companies coming into existence. New, new automobile t uh, technologies were being invented. It was a flourishing economy, just like we have now. You people are saying today, like the patent system is broken. It's holding up innovation. Of course, they're writing this on their smartphones while flying on airplanes at thirty thousand feet, accessing Wi-Fi on the very technology brought to them by the patent system that they're saying is broken and is holding up innovation. <laughs> same thing. Um, and by the way, you had the exact same story about the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers held up innovation. They sued Curtis, and they got in this big, again, a huge myth. Ron Katznelson did a great historical survey on this and showed with graphs and charts and everything exactly what was happening at that time, um, and, and so on and so on. Every time you hear these stories, typically, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a story that, that, that has become solidified as, as a myth, it's like the robber baron myths. And, um, and, um, and, you know, it's okay for you, by the way, when you hear this stuff. See, I live this stuff, and I have to know these things. I have to read Ron's articles, and I love Ron, too. He's a great guy. Um, and I have to, you know, because I'm in, this is my life. This is my work. This is what I, my job is, right? Um, 
it's okay for you when someone says that to you, for you to say, you know, I don't know that. You know, that's interesting. I've never heard that. I'll, you know, I'll have to go and look at that. You know, I never heard of Selden. I never heard of what, I don't know anything about the early automobile manufacturing or, and what was the situation with patenting of early automobiles, um, you know, and, 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 and what was the nature of the industry. And this is all, this is an interesting new statement you're making, um, but I can't assess it or make sense of it because I just don't have the context of knowledge for that. You know, and, and that's really important for the, you know, the college students, the young people in the audience. It's okay to say, I don't know. I say that a lot when I'm asked legal questions about topics I don't know, because <laughs> I specialize in intellectual property and property, and people often ask me questions about broader issues in constitutional law and things of that sort. I say, you know, those are complicated areas of law. I have some insights on them, but, um, but they're not my area of expertise, so oftentimes I just don't know the answer. Um, but this time I do, because of the, but only because of the research that Ron Katz Nelson did. Um, so, and, um, and you can go look it up, although it's, it's highly technical writing, so um, you should spend your time actually uh, on, on the values that you're pursuing in your life, too. <laughs> Michael from the live stream asked, can you comment on digital rights management and mm -hmm. encryption controls? DRM is now being used to create vertical monopolies in the publishing industry. <laughs> A growing number of authors are rejecting DRM, end quote. All right, so there's a, uh, a lot of great, uh, a lot of interesting points in that question, um, and um, and uh, uh, at the at, at, the, at the first issue, I'd say you know the, that um, it's not true that digital rights management. For those who don't know, digital rights management is the ability to use technology in the computer code, for instance, to control how your how you use your product your computer software. So whether you can transfer to other machines, whether you can um, transfer it over the internet, or how, and, and whether you can use it as a commercial enterprise versus as an end user, a private individual user, and things of that sort. It's one of the ways that we're trying to, through our property rights and contract rights, you know, define the scope of how we can protect and obtain the value of the works that creators have created and innovators have created that's being deployed digitally. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this is no different than, you know, the, you know, that when the leasehold that you sign, you know, it's not one paragraph. Anyone who's lived in an apartment knows it's like 50 pages, right? It's like you can't have water beds, you can't have dogs, you can't have fish, you can't have, you know, um, and no one says, oh, this is horrible. Um, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same type of control over the property that you have a legitimate right to control to, in order to exploit in the marketplace to return to, return to you the, va the values that you have a just right to receive. Um, so digital rights management actually are, is one of the ways that they've tried through the property and contract to protect their interests so they don't have to rely explicitly on special government uh, court decisions or even special government laws that had to be, have to be enacted to further protect their interests in the digital space. The problem is, is that you know, hackers are very good at getting around DRM just as much as they're very good at you know, hacking into your bank accounts and into, and into the phone systems and other things. So this is why people are abandoning DRM. It's not because... It's, you know, it's creating monopolies. That's not actually true. Um, and in fact, the term monopoly is an, is, is an invalid term um, that is legitimately uh, criticized by Ayn Rand and, and many economists. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I won't get into that details. I'll leave those for uh, other speakers and other topics. But um, I've written actually an article about how actually scholarly publishers, academic publishers, rely upon copyright to engage in the type of innovative creation of new business models and distribution of scholarly articles um, through journals. Um, and it was utterly fascinating when I interviewed them and found out the amount of tens of millions of dollars that they have to make and invest in these platforms for putting on the internet and, and publishing and hypertext linking of footnotes and everything of their articles to make them available to researchers. So in fact, copyright is, is actually a driver of innovation in the distribution of commercial works. The unfortunate thing is the hackers have made it virtually impossible to control your work once you put it on the internet. And the current government laws for copyright haven't provided effective, uh, effective protections. DRM was thought maybe we don't need new laws because we can try to do this through technological um, uh, uh, innovation that is predicated on our property rights. That turned out to be a, uh, um, a false lead as well. So we're kind of in a, in, a, in a difficult place right now. But you do need to protect these works um, because if, if, if you can't return, um, if you can't get a legitimate return on your investment, if you can't properly control how your, uh, the, uh, the values that you produce will be used, um, you will not create them. And um, just like a farmer won't create a farm if they can't stop people from coming on and stealing his crops. 
Hi. Uh, when I talk to software engineers about software patents, uh, they, I think they, they often see it, it happening a lot that they independently invent something or someone independently invents something and they only find out that there was a patent for it when they get sued, so they don't really feel like they're getting any value from yeah. the patent creator. And I think maybe what's contributing to this is there don't seem to be many software patent business models. People don't sell, it, it seems to me, or I'm not aware of a lot of businesses that actually uh, license software patents. They often license the, the code um, and or copyright, but not the patents. So is there a reason that that's not a common model? Yeah. Again, this is why I like question and answer period because there's a lot of complexities and there's a lot of um, uh, factual assumptions that actually aren't, aren't valid or don't reflect actually what's happening on the ground. So first of all, clarify for a moment. Um, software patents is a term I'm sure a lot of you have heard. You realize that that is not a term of art. There is no category in patent law called software patents. There, you do not apply for a software patent at the, at the patent office. There's, there's no even, at the patent office, they actually have specific fields, technological fields for reviewing patent applications. There's no software patent field that they review. Um, there, um, so this term itself is, it was a term created by critics of patents on computer programs and other types of software-based type systems in the high-tech industry as a way to start to try to criticize and attack it um, rhetorically because no one used that term in patent law um, and to, to this day patent lawyers don't use those terms that term um, and and also it's not true that there aren't actually software patent based business models Microsoft IBM Qualcomm all create software software programs computer programs that they get patents on that they license. In fact, Microsoft, for many of you may not know this, the majority of Microsoft's income for many of the past several years has, uh, in, until it started innovating again with things like the Microsoft Pro and, and Windows 10 and things of that sort, um, was from licensing its patents that covered the programs that were fundamental to the Android operating system. Microsoft brought in over a billion dollars in licensing revenue a year from just licensing its patents on that, those software programs. Qualcomm's entire business model, and by the way, Qualcomm, if, if you've never heard of Qualcomm, Qualcomm is what makes this possible. Qualcomm invented, the, um, or not Qualcomm, but the founder of Qualcomm, invented the CDMA transmission technology, the digital transmission technology used in every single cell phone in the early, in the early 1990s. At the time, uh, a physicist said it, it violates the laws of nature. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> said, well, I got a patent on it, and, patent <laughs> so, um, and it made possible uh, you know, the, this technology. Qualcomm's entire model is licensing their patents. Um, so it's not true that there aren't actually patent-based licensing uh, products. IBM doesn't sell any products anymore. It licenses. And what is it licensed based upon? Patents and copyrights. Um, one of the big reasons why software companies rely upon copyrights still to this day, even though patents protect the functionality of the programming, and that's what the value is, is because the rest of the world doesn't protect software the way we do. So if you want to sell Windows 10 in, um, in other countries, the only way you're going to get protection for it is through copyright. We are innovative, and we, and we in the United States, we're unique among the, among the world and say, no, software innovation is a type of technological innovation. And it makes sense when you think of it at an intuitive level, right? A word processing program is a digital equivalent of a typewriter. And a typewriter was patented in the analog manufacturing world of the 19th century. There is no reason whatsoever why a new, valuable, useful type of innovation in the digital context, as long as it meets all of the requirements for getting a patent, shouldn't issue for a digital equivalent of that in the 21st century. We didn't say no to typewriters because people have been writing with quills before that. And we don't say no to digital equivalent of programs. You can say the same thing, email is, is mailing. <laughs> um, so, it's, so there's actually software has been, or, and, and patents have been foundational to the evolution and growth of the high tech um, industry. The problem with software engineers today is that, there, is that many of them are ideologically opposed to IP protection as such because they see it as stopping me from doing all the cool tinkering with all of this code that I'm doing with and working with. And the reason why they don't know about patents is because they choose not to look at them. Not because, you know, they're surprised, not because they couldn't know, it's that they choose not to look at them. Every other industry in the entire country that uses patents, the automobile industry, manufacturing, they have what are called preclearance policies, 
What preclearance means is that when there's someone that comes up with a new invention in their company, the first thing they do is they go to the patent office because all patents are online. You can search it on, on, online. And they search the patents. They see, well, do we have clearance of rights in this technology to go into the marketplace with it? And because of ideological opposition to patents, <laughs> um, uh, and it, is, it was rooted in ideological opposition. A lot of high-tech companies, like Google and other places, said, we will refuse to look at patents. We think these are invalid. That's a, that, 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 that justifies these things by looking at them. We're not going to. Oh, now we're shocked that there's patents that cover the new technology we're coming up with, and it's not actually new. Um, so a lot of the problems in the high-tech space that they claim about like not knowing about inventions and innovation, it's a problem of their own making. And in fact, the business models in the high-tech industry, actually, uh, many of them, Foundational models, like and um, and I have to emphasize, like you know, you had the same R and D dynamics in the high tech space as you have in the, in, in the biopharma space. You know, people, you often hear people say, "Oh yeah, anyone can write a program and it's really easy." Yeah, well that's true if you're talking about Flappy Bird, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about an operating system, an email system, a security system, um, you're talking about the code that runs on your on your smartphone. That's thousands, as you well know, thousands and thousands of man hours, years of work, right? Um, and so companies like Microsoft and Apple and Qualcomm, these have annual R&D budgets, 9, 10, 12 billion dollars a year. And that's R&D. That means, you know, money that they're investing that they don't see a return on unless they can propertize it you recoup those uh, investments and profit to make more investments and grow and flourish as a company. And they rely upon patents to do that. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, I guess my question is, so I'm not sure this is a foregone conclusion, but like for me it seems straightforward. Maybe you'll disagree with me, but like a lot of government things definitely at the beginning are a great idea and work really well. Like maybe NASA is a good example of this. Like amazing, it works great. But then over time it like gets bloated and things get worse and worse and just trend towards being very inefficient and like th doesn't the patent system suffer from this and like what is there any way to resolve that is it just going to long term take more and more time to process like I've been involved in a couple of patent applications that went through but it's like super onerous and it seems like mm -hmm. probably it'll just get worse and like there'll be more special interests and the laws will get more arcane and crazy yeah. and like there'll be more people giving talks about how it's not working and, you know <laughs> yes, uh, great question. In fact, I'm getting the stop, so, this, this stop indication, and I want to respect the property rights of Ocon. So this will be the last question, um, and I'll take that five minutes now that Anu stole from me. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the, um, it's a great question because it, more fundamentally what you're getting at is uh, NASA is not a good example because they shouldn't have done NASA from the get-go. That should have been private. Right? It's not the government's job to put us in space. It's the government's job to protect the rights of the people coming up with the technology. It's like Goddard got to patents on rocket technology and things of that sort. The NASA used the integrated circuit invented by Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce um, uh, to get to the moon and things of that sort. Um, so, but that should have been private. So what, but what you're getting at is a more fundamental point, which is, that, uh, which is the same recognition that the founders had in the debates over the Constitution, which is, at the end of the day, a government just reflects the culture from which it comes. Right? And to the extent that you have bad ideas in the culture at large, people no longer embrace freedom, no, people no longer agree with the protection of rights of life, liberty, and property, and people no longer agree with the free market and the foundations of what it means to have a flourishing society, then you are going to ha see the government act on that because the government is just an expression of the culture from which it comes from. At the end of the day, the Constitution itself is just a piece of paper, as the founder said, or as a parchment, right? It can't stop changes in the culture and bad ideas coming up. And so, um, yes, the patent system has become um, diluted in the same way that the, all of our property rights are diluted, right? I mean, you, owners of land and, and people who run businesses well know that, that don't work with patents, that they're crushed by regulations from e EPA and OSHA and, the, and FDA and all these other, you know, the whole alphabet soup agencies that exist in the, in, in the administrative state today. And so it's not the problem with the patent system, it's a problem more generally, and it shows you that the cure isn't to direct our efforts politically, 
The cure is more fundamental than that, right? We have to change the ideas and the culture. We have to change the philosophical foundations again and bring people back to um, what is required for having a free society and a government limited uh, to just protecting the rights of life, liberty, and property through the rule of law and through proper political and legal institutions. And that's why it's important that we have event uh, conferences like this. That's why the Ayn Rand Institute is invaluable. And it's why your attendance here, learning these ideas, is extremely important. And that's why it's a great, great point to end on. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.